But what we see is a lot of money being spent and resources from these overseers to assist the healthcare providers or the medical device industry in making their products safer or doing things differently. Public health. It's on everyone's mind these days, from hand washing to emerging pathogens. Welcome to Transmission Control, an infection prevention podcast focused on your appetite for trailblazing thought, discussion, and innovations that will help you make informed decisions. Each episode, we speak with public health experts and safety champions from across the globe as they share their experiences, passion, and opinions. From investigative journalism to medical publications, we tackle real-world barriers to halting the spread of disease. Whether you are tuning in for education, inspiration, or to hear the stories that need to be told, thank you for joining us. And now, get ready to blast off with your weekly injection of insight on transmission control. This week on Transmission Control, we speak with Lisa McGifford, patient safety activist at Patient Safety Action Network, and we're going to be talking about all of Lisa's great work today, Larry, and really around patient advocacy. We're going to be talking about reporting, not only medical device reporting, like very similar to our very first episode of Transmission Control with Christina, formerly from the Kaiser Health News, who has recently accepted the position as the lead reporter focusing on the FDA for the New York Times about the MOD database. But also we're going to be talking about death certificates, reporting. We're going to relate that to COVID. It's going to be a pretty comprehensive conversation today, but it is all going to be centered around advocacy. And you're going to get some tips and some information about why you should not only advocate for yourself and your loved ones, but also be sure to submit reports whenever you have a complaint so that data is logged and becomes actionable. Yes. And I'm going to ask Lisa about some issues that are dear to my heart, transparency in healthcare, accountability in healthcare. And I want her, as much as she may talk about COVID, I'd like her to also touch on superbugs. And particularly when she and I first connected some years ago, it was over a number of superbug outbreaks, that is multi-drug resistant bacterial organisms that were transmitted by contaminated reusable medical instrumentation. Lisa is a very, very important person. She's made significant changes in the world for all of us in healthcare. I'm really pleased to have her on, flattered that she would join our podcast, and really interested in hearing what she has to say about healthcare acquired infections in general. All right, we're going to be right back after a short break with Lisa McGifford. I'm Justin Poulin. And I'm Dr. Lawrence Muscarella. From 17 Studios, let's get into it. This is Transmission Control. Joining us now is Lisa McGifford, patient safety activist at Patient Safety Action Network. And Lisa, I know we reached out to you back when we first kicked off this podcast and you said, reach back out to me. I'm interested, but I got a few things going on right now. And I'm so glad that we're finally talking to you today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. We're honored to have you, Lisa. Absolutely. Very honored. And And Lisa, I would like for you to just kind of tell everybody who's listening, it'd be hard to think that they don't know who you are, but they may not. So tell them about kind of your unique story and your background. Yeah, thanks for that opportunity. Um, I've been a consumer and patient advocate on health issues for about three decades, mostly with my time at Consumer Reports, where I first worked at the state level in Texas. And then I started working nationally on patient safety issues through the Safe Patient Project. And when that project ended, the activists that we had organized around the country formed the Patient Safety Action Network, and I'm continuing my work through that nonprofit. So I think I want to say that the life of a consumer advocate or a public interest lobbyist is lonely in the halls of government. There are crowds of people who are paid by the healthcare industry that persuade elected officials to pull back on oversight, go light on sanctions, trust that they'll do the right thing. And I'm always amazed at the level of trust 
that people have in these industries. And then I remember that it's often connected to the fact that these industries are providing funding for elections and other things that elected officials have to pay attention to. So it is a real struggle to be that public interest person, that person who's speaking up for harmed patients. And, and so, you know, I, I like to bring in the voices of people who've been harmed and that's what our group does. And we are also focused on changing laws, regulations, policies that can make healthcare safer. And a lot of that work is through more transparency because, you know, secrets kill. Secrets are way too prevalent in our healthcare system. It reminds me of our very first episode. And we talked a lot, you know, about a, you know, secret hidden database. And that's a secret. (laughs) And you made an observation about it being lonely, right, in government as a patient safety activist. And so I'm sure that you've made several other observations because you said three decades of work in this area. I'm sure there are other themes or constants, you know, in terms of the dynamics in your role that you just see repeatedly. What other other things have you noticed in your work that seem to just come up over and over? Well, I hit on one of them, and that is transparency. There isn't much of it in the healthcare system. And the other is accountability. And these two seem to me to be the biggest problems. Everything can kind of fall in to these categories. We have systems in place today that are supposed to be looking out for the public and looking out for patients, but they're failing us. And they're failing us often, as I said, because they're captive of the very people that they're supposed to oversee. I can say that in the last 20 years, when it comes to patient safety, there's certainly been a lot more attention to that subject and to push the healthcare industry from hospitals to medical devices to be safer. But we have so little information to assess whether all those efforts are working. And the information is so limited. We have some information about hospitals, very little about doctors or ambulatory surgical centers, facilities like that. Not much on medical devices. And we'll talk some more of that about that. But it, it's still pretty limited when it comes to errors, medication errors, surgical errors, common issues in hospitals that cause harm to patients like falls and bed sores. And then, you know, we've got a lot of other harm that aren't really errors. It's just harm. And we've had some high profile issues about doctors who repeatedly harm patients, either through their surgical practices or sexual abuse. It's just been all over the news in recent years. So I guess what I've learned is I'm, I'm not a popular person because I'm focused on harm and I'm focused on ending it. And I don't see this, it, it, my responsibility to educate healthcare providers or other industry people. They should be doing that. My concern is whatever they're doing, is it working and is it improving? And I can't tell you the answer to that question today. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of doom and gloom. You know, that's what I'm here to talk about. And I do want to shake people up. I want them to think twice about what they're doing, what device they're getting put in their body or potentially unnecessary procedure. I want them to not be quite so trusting to ask more questions and be more proactive in their health care. You know, the, the legal environment, you know, is also something that limits this because I was thinking, you said you're in Texas, correct? That's correct. So I remember a podcast that I listened to probably nine months ago called Dr. Death. Yes. And, you know, the theme that came out in that was really that a lot of the institutions knew that there was an issue, but they didn't want to get into legal trouble. So when the doctor moved on to another health system, there was nothing communicated about that because they were avoiding legal liability. And I, I got to think that that's one of those things too. Like when you talk about transparency, there's a risk aversion that is 
contributing to that lack of transparency where somebody might ethically, even an organization, not an individual, you know, might otherwise want to communicate that information. And Dr. Death, Christopher Dunch, was one of those people that was on my list of high-profile cases and certainly illustrates well how a lot of this harm is kept quiet because people are bringing in money or no one wants to step up and speak out, as you said. So it is a good illustration of how the accountability system, like through the medical boards and even through some of the other maybe some of the other oversight agencies that exist for doctors failed the public and a lot of people were harmed. So Lisa, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about how when you and I kind of first started interacting and corresponding, I guess this is going back around six years. I knew of you before then, but we hadn't really communicated much until when the whole issue with superbug infections linked to contaminated flexible endoscopes started to appear on the front pages of many, many newspapers across the country. I guess this kind of began in 2015. So can you talk about your unique impressions of that? You thought about it, not so much of what happened, though you certainly can talk about that, but kind of your knee-jerk response to what you were seeing and, and how do you think that that happened, and more specifically, how did the government, in your opinion, if at all, how did the government fail us such that those outbreaks occurred, and were you comfortable then with what the government did, specifically FDA and CDC, what they did to prevent additional infections? Were you comfortable with the mitigations they implemented? Did you think it was enough? What are your whole thoughts about those superbug outbreaks that hit the press? My initial reaction was, you know, outrage, because it hit the press years after the hospitals actually knew that they were having these infections. And when I started exploring more details, I was astonished to find out that these were pretty common infections using scopes, but they were run-of-the-mill infections that could be treated easily. With, with antibiotics. antibiotics. So, right. So when, when the superbug infection was revealed, that's how, that's where it hit the streets. And, and, you know, just think about it. That's, that is the worst thing. It's more deadly, less treatable. But there were all these other infections that were happening that nobody really had ever known about. So for me, the implications were a lot broader. And when you think about all the different types of scopes people have used on their bodies, it should be a widespread focus of oversight to keep track of infections that happen with these scopes. And so I think, you know, the other thing that that sort of was interesting about this is that the duodenoscopes scopes that... The primary source of these outbreaks. Yes, that if I remember correctly, they were revealed first at Virginia Mason Hospital in Washington, which was known as a patient safety leader. So I was really surprised because I knew that about them, that there was no disclosure about this happening from the hospital, because I, of course, think disclosure is an important part of patient safety. Months later, it came out in the front page, I believe, the Seattle Times in January of 2015. Yep, yep. And it really took a long time for FDA to act. The uh, congressional hearings, uh, congressional committees got involved, and it was very clear in all of the investigations that the manufacturers cleaning procedures that were given to the hospitals were not doing the job. They were not working. Why did the FDA not know that beforehand? In other words, when I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you put a device into the field and you're giving it to hospitals to perform these minimally invasive endoscopic procedures, the manufacturer's responsibility is to sell the product. We get that. How do these devices get into the field where their instructions apparently had not been adequately validated for effectiveness, meaning if staff followed the actual cleaning and disinfection protocols detailed in the endoscope manufacturer's instructions for use, it appears that the data suggests that the 
endoscope could remain contaminated with organisms. Why did the FDA not pick this up, detect this, and understand this years earlier? Well, I don't think it's something that the FDA had reviewed at all. And I don't think it's something they routinely review. The thing about what you just said is that the FDA then, after these superbug infections were exposed, then they did the review and then they found out that these procedures were not effectively cleaning the scopes involved. I suspect also that there's some there's probably some carelessness on the part of the hospitals in cleaning scopes, although that was not what was discovered in this case. That probably exists in other cases. And it's something that people have to be really diligent about, and we don't really have any idea how diligent they're, they're being. You bring up an excellent point in that it appears, at least in this scenario with endoscopes and possibly others, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds as if the FDA was kind of being reactive to a situation rather than having maybe done a risk analysis beforehand so that they could have been more proactive to prevent these outbreaks from occurring, these endoscopes from from remaining contaminated despite being, quote unquote, cleaned and disinfected. Is that fair? Yes, I think that's absolutely fair. And I think that's generally how most devices get on the market. I'm not going to use the word approved because a lot of them are cleared through a process that is less than rigorous, that only requires devices to show that they're similar to another device that's on the market. So there is not... Right, the predicate streamline, that's right. Yes, streamlines, yes. You know, what I constantly hear about issues like this and even about healthcare-acquired infections and hospitals in general, people believe that someone is watching over this. Aren't they? And (laughs) no, not really. There, you know, we have a very complex healthcare system and we don't have transparency. We don't have a system that requires reporting and actually acts if reporting was not done, uh, like from hospitals. I believe that hospitals, and you can correct me, Larry, if I'm wrong, are required to report harm from medical devices, including infections, to the FDA database called MOD. Within 10 working days of knowing of the event. Exactly. So that's not being done. And that's one of the things that could possibly improve oversight is if there was a more attention at the ground level to the people who should be reporting to FDA. You know, FDA cannot be in every hospital room in the country. You know, they just cannot. And so we, and same thing with medical boards or anybody who's, uh, has responsibility for oversight. So you have to have a process in place to, for people to tell the overseers, the regulators, what's happening, when bad things happen, and have an agency that responds to those reports in a timely manner quickly. That is not in place everywhere in this country. And we recently did an interview really talking about the staffing models. And so you talked about they can't be in every single hospital. Mm -hmm. But I think the funding is also not there to support this kind of, you know, oversight. Correct? Uh, Currently. (laughs) Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to comment on you. You were talking about the oversight of healthcare practice in America or let's talk in this context about the oversight of medical devices prior to reaching the market, after reaching the market, and the oversight of whether medical facilities are properly cleaning and disinfecting these reusable devices so they don't transmit disease. Could you focus a little bit more on what you define as oversight? One, listening to you would say oversight means There's kind of the teacher there at the front of the class, and if the student misbehaves, he may get his knuckles hit with a ruler. What I've been learning is that oversight, or let me pose it as a question, it appears to me that oversight isn't necessarily what the listener might think. And we kind of get into the situation of oversight where the regulator is working with the entity that it is to be overseeing rather than necessarily correcting and, if you will, admonishing or forcing change. 
And there's Absolutely. a number of agencies or organizations. Could you talk a little bit when you say overseeing yeah. what you really mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are definitely uh, across the board is uh, uh, a too cozy relationship between the overseers and those being overseen. And that has led over the years to this relationship that you just described, that where the, the people who are the regulators who are responsible for protecting the public are actually, instead of taking a product off the market, shutting down a hospital's wing until they get the infection under control, things like that are hardly ever heard, heard of. You mean that's not happening? Instead, no, not, not by the, not by the regulators. And they, you know, you get an infection. <laughs> outbreak of MRSA, MRSA infection outbreak in schools. They shut the school down and clean it up and down and bring all the kids back a week later. You know, that doesn't happen in a hospital in a, in a, or in a hospital unit. But but what we see is a lot of money being spent and resources from these overseers to assist the healthcare providers or the medical device industry in making their products safer or doing things differently rather than saying, hey, don't use this device until you have this fixed. They're more consultants than overseers? That's a good way to put it. Um, It feels that way sometimes. That ties to my question why I was at the funding piece, which is how do we as a society – try to get the money into this kind of a thing. And, and I was going to say also, is it something that should be, you know, don't run by the government or should it be a separate, you know, agency, not necessarily for profit, but should it be a nonprofit agency that's running kind of with that funding, but separate from the government? So I think what you're talking about is, as Larry just said, the, the consult, almost like in a consulting capacity, I think you're already kind of leading me to the answer. So, I want to give something actionable to the listening audience. Like, how can they help ma- help us well, I don't improve think this? Putting it off to private agent, private entities is the right way to go. I mean, I think that's what we're seeing with FDA in post market surveillance. They're they're sort of encouraging private organizations to take in post market surveillance duties, but those those entities, those organizations, are not responsible to the public. At all. I mean, it has to be government because government is responsible to the people. And if you have regulators that are not doing their job, then you need more pressure from the public for them to do their job. Unfortunately, the forces for the industries are more powerful and more well funded in the halls of government. And so you have this constant problem of funding giving the agencies enough funding to be sure that products are safe or services are safe. And then you have the strings that are tied to the money for how the agency uses it. And all of that is influenced by highly paid ubiquitous lobbyists from the state to the federal government. So it it is a, you know, I don't know if it's actionable, but I do think that our voices are drowned out. The public's voices are drowned out by the omnipresence of the industry lobby in all these areas. So, Lisa, you created a, an amazing dichotomy, and I'm kind of thinking this through now as I talk with you. When we were watching TV with COVID, we saw anything but a lack of transparency, if you will. We saw anything but silence, things hidden behind closed doors. We saw numbers every day of deaths being updated on the TV. So this raises the question as to why the public was so informed of COVID deaths, but so uninformed, or where we see doors open with COVID infections and deaths, we see doors closed with, for example, superbug infections and deaths. So there's something more going on here. Yes, the COVID deaths were generally community acquired, which is different than the superbug deaths being healthcare associated. But there's some more dynamic here that is going on that explains the difference. And I'll end by saying this. 
When I read the CDC's documents and publications talking about superbug deaths, you often see the CDC saying, we can't conclude that the superbug was responsible for the death, and I probably have 10 examples in mind, because there were comorbidities present. They, yes, the superbug may have played a role in the patient's death, but we just can't say for sure. And so as a result, the death certificate rarely will list superbugs as a contributing factor to death. That will rarely be, be stated because, again, comorbidities are often involved, and according to the CDC and other experts, comorbidities can interfere with the determination of the superbug being the cause of death. How then, when we go to COVID, did all of a sudden things so change, where the CDC even wrote guidance saying, we can conclude a patient died of COVID even if we haven't tested them to confirm that they were infected with COVID. Imagine us having a situation where we wrote on the death certificate, superbug as the cause of death. We'd have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients dying from superbugs, certainly across the world and a a lower number in the United States. Why this difference between how the CDC kind of focused on superbug infections, playing them down almost in terms of the disclosure, but with COVID, so playing them up? Well, there are a lot of questions in there. (laughs) I do think that there is something to the issue of being community acquired versus healthcare acquired. Basically, in this country, reporting of infections and other harm comes from the people who cause the harm. And, you know, it's just human nature. You're not going to get the kind of reporting when they cannot be blamed. And I'll use that word. They don't like to use word blame, but, you know, when they cannot be held responsible. So I think for COVID, being in the community is important. But also, I think it was a good illustration of how journalism stepped in. Early on, there was a teenager in Seattle who had a database that he put up to try to to start showing the numbers as early in the pandemic. And, you know, I think that was kind of kind of shamed the government a bit. But then after that, we had the COVID tracking project and also Johns Hopkins and other private entities who took the data and put it out there to the public in a way that is usable. And it's one of the things that we lack. I mean, in this country, we have data. We have data about what happens to people in hospitals. We have data that's even reported to CDC. But there are not the regular translating of that data into something that people can understand. I was recently on on a call where when the COVID data first started being reported, somebody put up a map showing all the states that were reporting and Nebraska was completely blank. And that pointed out, they're not reporting. Why aren't they reporting? You know, they got public pressure and internal pressure from the public health department to report the data to the public. So you need that kind of push and pull. I would say that my feeling about COVID is that we know now that we can get timely data about bad things happening in our healthcare system, that it's possible if we pull together and require reporting, ask for the data, disclose the data. So I think COVID is a watershed moment. This is a watershed moment. And I'll talk about death certificates in a minute if you want. Well, I'd like to even move into that now because I think you said it was a watershed moment and I respect that very much. But I want to add a caveat to that where while it was a watershed moment, I think it's potentially a problematic one in this sense. There was an article, a number of articles in 2020, September 2020, that were interviewing national experts about at that time, there was about 180,000 deaths, quote unquote, due to COVID. And the conclusion was, we know that all those deaths were due to COVID. They weren't due to a comorbidity. But when you say there's data in this transparency, I want to add this point to your watershed moment. 
that data should never be published, in my opinion, and I'm interested in your in your view on this, unless it has been validated. Data that have not been validated, to me, is almost useless data. And in the world of COVID, the gold standard is the medical record, not the death certificate, in my opinion. I don't believe we have any studies that have gone back and looked at the published quote-unquote COVID data to determine whether corrections are needed, whether the number of deaths are actually significantly higher or significantly lower, meaning we haven't audited the medical records of people who died from COVID to confirm and compare against the death certificate to get a sense of how accurate those death certificates were that we were then putting on TV. So can you comment a little bit about your views about publishing data raw data that maybe haven't been checked yet is what I mean by validated, or are you in agreement that the data should be validated to confirm accuracy and completeness before it is published? Because otherwise, we can have government actions that are being implemented, adopted, that are based on raw data that are potentially inaccurate. So my view is validate the data and then act, not necessarily the other way around. Your thoughts? Uh, I, I agree with you that we want accurate information, but I have seen how the validation process with healthcare acquired infection reporting, for example, has slowed down the reporting significantly. Good point. It, it gives, gives enough time for the reporters to manipulate the data so that it says something else. And, and I think, I, you know, I, I frankly think that it, sometimes we need the raw data. For example, CDC collects information about healthcare acquired infections. They do not share all the data with the public and they do not validate every single piece of data. They'll tell us how many infections occurred, but they won't give us an, a denominator. How many people were subject to that infection so that we can really see what the percentage is. Instead, they create comparative, you know, methods to compare hospitals, which is useful. But at some point, we want to know the numbers. You know, we want to know. The public wants to know, how many people got infected at my hospital last year? What's my likelihood of getting infected? They don't want to know that X percent of the patients, not even X percent, that an infection ratio of the patients who went into a particular ICU in a particular hospital got infections. That doesn't tell us anything. So I think that a lot of times I don't mean to uh, dismiss the importance of accurate data and validation does have to happen. But when you have a crisis like covid I think it's, it was perfectly reasonable to put COVID on the death certificates as, as a contributing factor because we don't really know. In fact, in my community in patient safety, we would love to have that on death certificates. We have wanted to get infections or medical errors somewhere on the death certificates. Even, even a check the box that says that there was an infection or error connected with the death or before the death would help. That simple step actually on death certificates led to more attention for maternal and infant deaths that were highly publicized in recent years and and got a lot of attention, especially with African-American mothers. So I think that the death certificates you know, it is important to know what is happening with this patient. And I'm, I'm reluctant. I don't want for a couple of people or even a whole group of people to be arguing and auditing and evaluating whether the person died from the infection or from the heart surgery, you know, but you know, the complications from heart surgery. That is a blocking, that blocks information to the public that they need to see. Two points. Would you agree then, the first question is, would you agree then that there should be a box for multidrug resistant organisms as a potential contributor? Question one. And question two, what are your thoughts about putting out all those COVID deaths when the guidance from the CDC 
unlike any other pathogen that I'm aware of, did not require a test to confirm the patient was infected. So to avoid overshoot, where we're saying people died of COVID that didn't even have COVID, how do we correct for that overshoot and how do we apply similar paradigms for COVID to superbugs? Well, good luck in getting everyone to test the patients as to whether they have infections and to have the lab capabilities to figure out exactly which bug it was that they had. And, and, you know, that would take years, probably. You know, when these COVID, you know, initially we didn't have good tests. And, you know, probably everybody listening knows somebody who said, I had every symptom of COVID. The doctors and hospitals said I had COVID, but I had no positive tests. You know, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that we need, you know, we need to know how many people died who the experts at the time would be the people treating these, these patients believe that COVID was present and let's put it on the death certificate so we can, we can try to get a handle on what's going on. One other thing about COVID, I'm not worried about overcounting deaths with COVID because so many people died in their homes. I suspect that COVID was not attributed to many people's deaths over the last couple of years. I would argue we would not want hospitals putting superbugs on death certificates if we couldn't have proven that the superbug was actually the cause. But I, I, yeah. do, I, do, un, I do understand your point. Maybe the, the solution to this, as we wind down, maybe the solution to this is we put out those raw data, but then later we, sh- we have caveats saying they're raw data, they're not final data, and then later – when we have time, we do a validation where we could even have a correction factor because I think ultimately when history looks back, we want to know the actual number of people that died and and, and make the point that this sure. does not count all of them because of people dying in houses. But I think when we start crossing this line, where we start getting into this area, there was a report, and I'll be very brief, where the CDC recently was discussing a teacher in Marin County, California, and the CDC's report stated that the teacher was the index patient. And that the COVID-19 outbreak originated with an unvaccinated teacher. And when I read the CDC's report, it actually turns out they weren't able to obtain a specimen from the teacher to even determine that the teacher was the index patient that they stated in the report was the index patient. And this starts to get into an area that I want to trust the CDC. I want to believe in them, but I don't want COVID to establish a precedent for us where we start getting a little loose with the facts moving forward. Uh, Your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that in your example of the superbug infections, they're not going to know there was a superbug infection unless they did a test. You know, that's Excellent just point. the way it works. <laughs> and so I, I'm not worried about that, but they might not be able to tell that this superbug infection was the actual thing that stopped right. this person from living. Right. And that's where we are today. Yes. Today, it's, you know, everybody wants it to be so accurate and precise and true. And, oh, dear, we don't want too many infections to be reported. But we know those infections are happening in the hospital. And we know the report that CDC just came out with showed an increase in almost every category of infections that they collect in the last year. And that is something that people should be worried about. But nobody's talking about that. The CDC didn't even do a news release about that report that was released on Monday. And you the know, reason and why? I don't know. Don't ask me. You know, I don't know. I went and looked to see if they had a news release <laughs> because I thought, well, big news. Infections really went up. Not COVID infections, but other infections significantly, some of them as high as 50% higher in in, uh, ICUs. Hospital Hospital acquired infections. That takes us back to the community acquired versus healthcare associated debate. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm concerned about what goes on in hospitals, you know, and that's my work. And Kaiser health news just came out with a report today that said more than 10,000 people were diagnosed with COVID in the in U.S. hospitals last year after they were admitted 
for something else. And that certainly that's an undercount because they used Medicare data and data from California and Florida only. It's about 21% of them contracted COVID in the hospital between April and September of last year died. So they went into the hospital for something else. They got COVID and they died. What do you make of that? Well, I, there probably are multitude reasons. I mean, the infection control was not up to speed in the hospital. It was chaotic. COVID was was spreading in hospitals. The few patients who were there, I mean, there were a lot of patients who didn't even get to the hospital, you know, go to the hospital who needed care. But what that shows us is that the routine prevention techniques were not being followed with COVID patients or with other patients. There are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, it, 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 it has to do with PPE. It has to do with short staffing. It has to do with a lot of hospital pro- protocols. It has to do with mass confusion about COVID and constant, constantly learning about it as we were going. I mean, the, the messages and the, the things that people should be doing to prevent the spread constantly changing. It took more than a year for for CDC to say it's aerosolized. Air, a, airborne. Oh, it, it's spread in the air. It's air, in Correct. the air. Right. And, and so that changed everything. So part of it was, in my opinion, hospitals not being responsible to make sure that their workers had proper equipment and that, that there were enough workers to handle the crisis. And part of it was just that we, there was so much we didn't know when we were learning as we were doing. But when you put the COVID acquired infections in hospitals next to the increasing hospital acquired infections that are normally reported like MRSA and central line associated infections and urinary tract infections, when you put them side by side, you see infections going up. So it can't just be blamed on COVID. Yes. I mean, well, maybe it can be blamed on COVID. I mean, yes, it can maybe, be throwing you know, resources there, there away. Prevention techniques, uh, but it had a, I'll say it had an impact much broader than COVID. Yes. Yes. I was going to say the, the impact that COVID had definitely reaches out into those staffing issues. And we already, know that, you know, nurses are retiring, so we have less care providers that are available to treat patients. And so if you're understaffed, if you're in a situation where you're constantly just robbing Peter to pay Paul to bring, you know, recruit a nurse from this hospital over to another one, it doesn't really solve the problem. And uh, it's not a surprise to me. And it's the staffing issue doesn't just lie in nursing either. It lies in lots of ancillary support services. The workforce crisis is, is also contributing at the same time. And the boomer generation is expediting their retirement because of the COVID environment and the fact that they're a high risk population. So it's being compounded, what I would say is maybe not an exponential rate, but much faster than we had originally anticipated this would impact human resources that we have in this country, not only in healthcare, but really for every everything that we do, including supply chain, which also impacts our ability to get the supplies that are needed to care for patients. So, you know, we're in a dangerous, we're at a dangerous crossroads here for sure. I want to just point out your website just in case anybody wants to learn more. They can go to www.patientsafetyaction.org. And it's a great website. If you want to learn more about them, have a very comprehensive about us, but there's committees so that you can get involved. There's also a place for you to share your own story so you can submit your own patient experience story as well. You can become a member. There's so many resources in here. There's a blog, there's videos, just tons of content. You know, I, I had said earlier, you know, what can people do? And that's one thing. They can visit your website. They can learn more. If we opened a little bit of Pandora's box, maybe they'll take an even deeper look, you know, into to what's going on. I think awareness is really important, Lisa, and that's why we brought you on to the podcast, is hopefully to help you increase awareness. If anybody wants to follow your work, 
on Twitter. It's at PT, short for patient, PT Safety Action. And I also wanted to ask you, Lisa, just a closing simple question. You know, what would you like people to do moving forward, you know, to get more engagement and more involvement and increase this awareness? Well, I think that they need to ask more questions on a personal level when they're getting health care, more questions about safety of procedures and and look into what's being done to them and uh, do a little research on it. But I also think that people need to understand that filing complaints with these agencies that have a responsibility to oversee the healthcare system is important. And it may feel like you're just spitting in the wind, you know, and it's going nowhere. But if they get a critical mass, and we've seen that with medical devices like breast implants and Esure, which is a reproductive device. Uh, the Bleeding uh, Edge. The Bleeding Great Edge show movie, on Netflix. Yes. And that's where people started filing complaints and then they found each other and organized. So don't hesitate to file a complaint uh, when you have had an error or an infection or you've had a problem with a device. Find out who the uh, official agency is who's res- that's responsible and uh, file your complaint. And that's one way that everybody can do their part. They can contact you, Lisa, for additional guidance. <laughs> sure. Yes? Yeah, they can contact us. And on our website, we have a contact us address that they can send questions to. And they can also join our Facebook page, Patient Safety Action Community. Patient Safety Action Network Community, I think is the full name. And it's a pretty active group and they can ask questions there and we can have a dialogue about things that they're concerned with. And if if you can't find them on Facebook, if you do go to the website, there are links directly through so that you can follow on Twitter and join the Facebook group as well. So I'll just add that um, just in case. And Lisa, you did a phenomenal job. And I think I just want to thank you for sharing your candid thoughts on all the topics that we discussed today. Uh, really appreciate you making time to come on the show. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. That was Lisa McGifford, patient safety activist at Patient Safety Action Network. And you can visit their website, as I mentioned, www.patientsafetyaction.org. You can follow them on Twitter at PT Safety Action and then also find their group on Facebook. But you've got links to Facebook and Twitter right on that patientsafetyaction.org website. Larry, you know, this is obviously a labor of love. For Lisa, you know, love of humanity and, you know, really just trying to increase the awareness. And what I really heard that we didn't talk about was self-advocating as a patient or the family member of a patient or a soon-to-be patient to really have that awareness of what the procedures are going to be like when you go in, what the risks are that are associated, and I really want to emphasize what she said, that if you've had an experience that has not gone well, to make sure that you report that. She made a really good point about human psychology that people sometimes feel like when they submit those, they don't go anywhere. But once there's enough of them, once there's enough reports and enough information and it keeps coming in, eventually somebody's got to do something. And if anybody's ever read the Malcolm Gladwell book, The Tipping Point, you know, every little bit helps because eventually you do hit the tipping point. And as Lisa said, people who have complaints can contact her, can be connected with other people. And pursuing this grassroots model from the bottom up, one person can make a change and it applies to hospital infections. It applies to health care. So I think she made her point really clear to file those complaints and also she made a, another important point we've heard before, but we want to emphasize of not to take healthcare for granted. And when you go in for a procedure, please discuss with your healthcare practitioner, your physician, what those risks are that you referred to earlier, how we could assure that infections are not transmitted during the procedure, and just make the physician aware that you are concerned about getting an infection and you want to make sure everything that could be done is being done. And I think that's a very important conversation to have with your physician is not just how many days will you be in the hospital, how many days might be required for post-op, but what is being done to assure 
that you will not be exposed to and possibly contaminated with a multi-drug resistant organism. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support Transmission Control by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts. You can also find us on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or on your favorite podcast application. We also have bonus content for certain episodes, but you got to download our smartphone app for iPhone and Android. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review while you're there because your feedback is important to the show. And on behalf of Larry and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transmission Control. Transmission Control.